remember of the sermon comes from uh, Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32, which is the story of the prodigal son. As we know that, but the title of our sermon today is actually Bring the Fat of Death. We will talk about it. Jesus said there, and this is one of Jesus' parables, as you know, Jesus taught in parables that was one of his main ways to teach. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. <coughs> For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come home, and your father has killed a fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen. For all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead, has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. The story of the prodigal son is really two different stories in one. It is the story of the relationship between the father and the prodigal son. But it's also just as important to consider the relationship between the father and the elder son. This story could have ended without any emphasis on the elder son if it was just about bringing back someone who had been, been lost. But we must focus on both parts of the story because it's important in how Christians live and how Christians deal with each other. This parable is part of a series of parables that Jesus taught about things that had been lost and found. There was the lost coin that had been found. There was the lost sheep that had been found. The shepherd had a hundred sheep and one had been lost, but he went and found it. And in this case, the prodigal son who had been lost came back home and was also found. This parable, as I said earlier, is also consistent with storytelling in Israelite history of relationships among brothers and what happens to them. There's the story of Cain and Abel, the story of Jacob and Esau, and there's also the story of Joseph. It was, uh, he was the dreamer, but the brothers got mad at him and put him in the pit. As you, it reminds me of something that happened in my family one time. Is I think you probably know I was the oldest of four boys. My father was a Methodist minister. 
1975, we moved to a church called Salem in Ballantyne, South Carolina, which is in, outside of Herman. In that time, the parsonage was right across the street from a church, and the church had been around since about 1870. And it had a graveyard next to it. Well, my three younger brothers were just kind of uh, entranced with this graveyard. This was the first time they just, and there was, what made it more entranced was there was a man who would come over right after about two or three days after we moved there, somebody had died, and a fellow came over to uh, dig the grave with a backhoe. Well, the guy looked like Evil Knievel. I don't know, you probably remember Evil. He was a motorcyclist who jumped all kind of things and smashed himself up in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. The guy wore his sunglasses. Well, anyway, they were entranced with this guy, so they went over there and watched him dig the grave and all that sort of stuff. Well, at that time, my youngest brother, Stephen, was about two and a half years old. And, you know, he's about this high. Well, I, I helped my mother out with my brothers a lot and all that. Well, one day, one afternoon, about 4 o'clock, my mother came up to me and said, where is Stephen? I said, I don't know. She said, I can't find him. And I said, well, the last time I saw him, he was over there with David and Tim, the other two brothers, watching the guy dig the grave. So we walked over there, and sure enough, those two old other brothers of mine had put that little boy down that grave. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not big enough to get out. But he was okay. We heard him. We started. I said, he might be over there. And we got towards we got there. We heard, Mama, Mama. But we found him. He was okay. But it goes to show that, you know, there's these relationships among brothers. <laughs> and brothers have this love hate relationship. What's it? You know, my brothers and I beat up each other all for like 20 years. I was the eldest, fortunately, I didn't get beat up too much. But I beat the next brother up, he beat the next one, he beat the next one, and he the next The youngest brother beat the dog. So, <laughs> but anyway, but what's interesting now is all, uh, all of my brothers and I now have a very good relationship and have a very positive. But sometimes, but if you look at the Bible, sometimes these relationships don't always go well. But let's look a little bit more at the prodigal son. Most, anyway, this younger son, he had come to get his inheritance early from his father. This was not looked upon favorably in Jewish culture, but it was allowed. And his father went ahead and gave him the inheritance. Now, one thing to make sure that you realize in this situation, the youngest son of the culture, he only got one-third of the estate. The elder son, which we'll talk about later, he was entitled to two-thirds, and he was still entitled to. But the younger son went and he got his inheritance. And he goes off to a faraway country. Does that remind you of people today who go off to Hollywood or something like that? It's kind of all these things people do. Well, what does he do when he goes out there? He doesn't put his money into a 401k like he ought to. He squanders it. And by the time he gets gone and about that time he's saved nothing. So a famine comes. He has no money. And he finally has to resort to living with the pigs or working with the pigs, which has got to be the ultimate bad thing, especially considering he's Jewish. But think about how bad that was. And one of the things I've struggled with in my life as an elder son, I was a pretty good kid. My mother will be here later if you want to verify that. <laughs> but I tried to behave. But some of my <coughs> brothers of mine, they just misbehaving all kinds of stuff, which is, it makes it even worse when you're a preacher's kid. You know, people are always looking at you like you're in a fishbowl. Those other brothers of mine, but Steve and the little boy that was in the grave, he was okay. But the other two were just kind of crazy and wild and everything else. And sometimes I just kind of get upset about that. And I'm like, I, will, I just don't think they deserve all this. But ultimately, the story of this is the prodigal son, he comes back, and there's a line in the verse that said, He came to himself. And this is the critical part. This is when he realized what he had done. And he realized he had to go back to his father. And he realized he needed to tell his father, I have sinned. And that's critical too in this story too. Remember that. That he acknowledged his sin before his father. And he was actually willing to go back and be one of his father's own servants. But when he went back, another thing that was interesting about this story too is that when his father saw him from afar, he ran to him. That was how glad he was to see him. And this is a metaphor for what God the Father has been for us when he gave Jesus to die for us. 
he was wanting us back so bad. And it was actually very much against the culture for a man to run down the road to meet his son. But he did that. And, even, and his son at that point says, I have sinned. I will be your servant. But the father didn't require him to be the servant. He brought out the ring and the robe that at one time they think those were things that had belonged to the son that had, the father had kept. He gave them back to him. Then he said, bring out the fatted calf. And this was, a, this was a very important celebration. You just didn't do that all the time. But this is the metaphor for the Father that we have in heaven that shows the love for the Son who has sent. And He accepts Him back really without any condition. Although we must remember the Son did acknowledge that He had sinned. We will sing, we will sing if I don't forget to bring it up, the song Amazing Grace as we have our offering. <clears throat> Most of you know the song Amazing Grace. It's one of my favorite hymns. But what is the story behind the man who actually wrote the hymn? He was a man named John Newton, who had his own road to redemption, as I would call it. Newton lived from 1725 to 1807. And during the first part of his life, he was a British sailor. And he was actually very heavily involved in making money in the slave trade. There were also allegations that he at one time had raped an enslaved woman. He got to the point that he was so unhappy that he even considered suicide. But he finally realized that he needed to start reading the Bible. And he actually converted to what was called evangelical Christianity in 1748 when he was 23 years old. The problem was he still didn't quite get it because he continued to engage in the slave trade. But eventually, he went along his life and he realized that this was wrong. He became a Anglican priest in 1764. And in 1788, he had completely turned around and actually made happy.